morning. I hope you all enjoyed your coffee. Uh, mayor Sam Licardo is the 65th mayor of San Jose, elected in November of 2014. I recently finished reading the book, If Mayors Ruled the World. Barber asserts that cities and the mayors who run them are primary incubators of the innovations that shape our planet and our universe. Mayor Licardo has cultivated innovation in science, technology, and education in San Jose with programs like A Thousand Hearts for a Thousand Minds and continues to support efforts like the New Space Conference that are helping to drive the space renaissance in this city and in the world. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Sam Licardo. <clears throat> Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, and good morning. It's great to see folks here for the eighth year now uh, of this conference in San Jose, and we're thrilled to host you. Uh, we love having you, and we love having your tax dollars, so please stay here and spend lots of money. Uh, you know, this has been a really exciting time, I understand, in the space industry, and uh, I think many of you know of the roots of this industry here in the Valley. Uh, Back in the day when there was a lot of federal money in this, uh, clearly the industry has transformed now. And it's one primarily a private sector venture. And that's where Silicon Valley certainly does best, and that's where San Jose has done best. Uh, we are thrilled to have many uh, great companies here in San Jose that have been deeply involved uh, over the last few years in forging new frontiers. And I just want to thank uh, Hannah and all the folks who put uh, this effort together. Uh, we know this is an exciting time. We want San Jose to be in the middle of this. Our great companies are here doing incredible things and we want to support them. And if you just happen to have a company that's looking for a home, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll help you find a space uh, to scale here in San Jose in a place uh, where you'll be among the most innovative minds in the world. Uh, please uh, have a wonderful conference. We look forward to great things happening uh, from the collection of minds right here. Have a great day. So, since uh, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and jump in here. My name is Bruce Pittman, so I'm uh, the Chief System Engineer at the Space Portal at the NASA Ames Research Center, and I'm going to moderate the panel this morning. And we have an interesting topic to talk about. So I want to give you a little history lesson. So I'm going to start off and then Glenn's going to fill in the details here, but I want to take you back 100 years. March 3rd, 1915, long time ago. A lot of, a lot of changes happened since then. So back then, there was a, the, the 63rd Congress was coming to an end. It would end the next day. And so there was a rider that was attached to the Navy Appropriations Bill um, that year, which had this thing called the National Advisory Committee for Air and with a grand total budget of $5,000. And this was authorized for five years for a group of 12 individuals that would report to the president and advise him on the uh, aeronautics in, in the United States. And the situation was in 1903, another history lesson, December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers, Kitty Hawk, 
um, heavier, first heavier than air flight with a, with a person. Okay, so you think, hey, this is a big deal. That must have changed the world. Nada, nothing, zip. One, it was slightly some part of the paranoia of the Wright brothers, but it was also, um, since the government funded program, which was Samuel P. Langley, had ended up in the Potomac right before that, everybody had gotten kind of turned off to aviation. And so the US government didn't buy the first airplanes for almost five years. And it was 1908 before we bought the, the first airplanes. And then I think we bought two. Well, the Wright brothers, you know, were a little bit frustrated by this, and so what they did is they went over to Europe. So in 1908, they took off for Europe. They got invited over there, and so they went over and uh, flew around Paris. And that took the continent by storm. The, the Europeans were very excited about this and very open to this. And so the next year, in 1909, the British started two things. One was the, the British Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, and the British Royal Aircraft Factory were both set up. And that kind of set the pace in Europe for what was going on. And so, fast forward to 1912-ish period, a lot of people were looking at what's going on in Europe and say, hey, we're behind. You know, we're, we're losing our edge here if we, you know, or we've already lost it. And so the question was, is what do we, what do, we do about it? So that's what led to the foundation of the NACA. By the time World War I started, which was in July 1914, we were hopelessly behind. The, the Europeans, the British, the, the Russians, and everybody had been putting far more money in, and everything into aircraft than we were. And so the NACA was established to help answer that challenge, make America get back into the game, become a world leader again, and fundamentally understand this, this both the science and the technology of aeronautics and flight. And so as I said, Glenn's gonna give us the details of that, but, um, and it was successful. There, the NACA was able to do a lot of, of really incredible things, both on the on the management side. One of the things that had greatly inhibited this this development in America was this big patent fight between the Wright brothers and Glenn Curtis. They had kind of brought everything to a halt, so that the the NACA helped broker this deal with what was established, what was called the Manufacturers Aircraft Association, and a cross licensing agreement there and a, a royalty. Uh, fee arrangement that kind of broke that logjam and really allowed for innovation to come back to the to the United States, um, and so they had some real successes with both the technology and uh, with things like um, fundamental aerodynamics and the and the uh, the airfoils and cowlings and everything that, that they applied to air to aircraft uh, navigation, weather, and particularly icing was a big problem back in those days. And the and the NACA did a, a tremendous amount of. Um, of, of work in those areas. And laboratories were established. First the Langley uh, Laboratory in uh, Hampton, Virginia in 1920, uh, then Ames in 1939, and, and then uh, what was called the Lewis Research Center in 1940, um, and then finally the, uh, the Flight Research Center down at, uh, in, in Mojave. Um, but there were some challenges as well. So what we'd like to do in this panel is to look back at kind of the last hundred years and say, what have we learned in this period of time? What, what happened, the good, the bad, you know, the not so good, um, and what can we learn from that as we go forward? And then, you know, in 58, when NASA was established by, by Congress, um, the, they rolled pretty much all of NACA, whoops, excuse me, all of NACA into NASA, and so, so NASA was kind of built around the kernel of this, of this previous organization and they carried over some things. And, and one thing that I want to do that Gary's going to talk about at the end here, and there was one little line in the, in the NASA authorization, it was kind of a throwaway line at the, at, the, at the end that was very important for what we're trying to do right now, and it's called Other Transactions Authority. So what, what Congress gave to NACA, or to NASA, which no, no, at the time no other government agency had, was this other transactions authority. When a contract or a grant was not appropriate, NASA had the ability to use this other transactions authority. And so um, we're gonna talk about what that has enabled and what we've been able to, to do with that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go kind of
start off with Glenn Bugos is the uh, historian um, at NASA Ames and the history office at NASA Ames, and he's going to give us kind of, kind of the background of this. Um, then we're going to have Dr. Michelle Gates is the program director of the Asteroid Redirect Mission at NASA headquarters, and she's going to talk about some of the innovative things that they're trying to do with that mission and, and kind of look at new ways of doing things to try to, to um, bring these kinds of exciting missions uh, about. Then we're going to have Jeff Grayson, who's the uh, co-founder and uh, Chairman of the Board of XCOR Aerospace and uh, a very thoughtful person um, in, in these matters. And so I was really glad that Jeff agreed to be here because I know he's done a lot of thinking on this. And he actually still uses the NASA TMs uh, and the NACA TMs that came out in the in the, in the olden days, uh, as part of as part of his company, and finally, um, Gary Martin is the uh, the director of the partnership directorate at, at NASA Ames. And he's going to talk about some of the exciting things that are going on right now, and some of the new things that NASA is trying to do to enhance partnerships and the way that that industry, government, and academia can work together um, better. So, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn, and we'll get this started. So, we're going to do we're going to do some uh, the. Brief presentations from, from this. I'm going to start off with some questions and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So, hope you enjoy. Thanks, Bruce. That was actually a great um, introduction to the history of the NACA. Um, so, show of hands, how many people in here had actually heard of the NACA before Bruce mentioned it? That's great. Actually, you know, the numbers uh, uh, of engineers that know about the NACA is probably greater uh, than the number of historians because the uh, technical reports are still uh, in such wide use. Uh, so because it's the uh, centenary of the NACA, uh, the NASA history community is taking this opportunity to sort of ask the question about whether or not the NACA, as they say in the uh, um, Lion King, still lives in you. Um, it's a, a cause to reflect on uh, the culture of the NAC and whether or not um, there is a legacy of it within NASA today. So the NACA lasted a fairly short period of time, 43 years from 1915 to 1958, and it's been gone longer than that, almost 57 years. Um, yet it lives, I think, um, in memory and in legacy because it embodies some essential government functions. Functions that can hide in other organizations, um, but can never completely go away as long as there is space to explore and people to make money doing so. Uh, so here's a, a quick history. Um, Bruce uh, mentioned its uh, humble beginnings. Uh, the word committee in its name was actually uh, very meaningful throughout its um, uh, lifetime, but especially during World War I, uh, when the advisory in the name was also very meaningful. Of the 12 members, uh, 12 of them came, uh, of the 12 members in the NACA committee, half of them were from the military services or other government agencies uh, related to aircraft like the Weather Bureau or the National Bureau of Standards. The other half were academic experts. The military came with questions about why their aircraft were underperforming, and the other members um, advised them on a specific solution. They did some important contracted studies, um, as with William Durand at Stanford University, who did a parameter variation study on the effectiveness of propellers. Uh, the NACA opened its first laboratory in 1920 in Langley, Virginia, and soon the NACA became associated with wind tunnels and other great uh, experimental facilities. By the late 1920s, the uh, culture of the NACA uh, the policy business uh, was turned over to the Commerce Department, and the NACA began focusing more on assessing and advancing the state of the art in aircraft technology. The NACA, NACA support of airmail reflects this transition. Early on, the NACA uh, advocated airmail as a top government priority, as a killer app for getting uh, the industry started. Uh, the Army started airmail with disastrous, with disastrous results. Uh, the Post Office took over in 1918, and by 1924, they were flying airmail around the clock, coast to coast, and with the best safety record of any air operation. That's the point when Congress turned it over to private contractors, who then made a lot of money on it. That safety record in the airmail was built largely um, because NACA surveyed the problems they were having and gave advice on operational issues, weather patterns, navigation aids, airport layouts, as well as tweaks to the aircraft that they had to use. Uh, World War I aircraft were still being used, but the NACA did a complete survey of problems with the aircraft, um, and uh, uh, they were very well understood. Um, uh, uh, the aircraft were, and that's when the NACA began to realize that uh, its role in the uh, ecosystem of aircraft uh, may be in constructing an architecture of aeronautical knowledge. Uh, after AML went private uh, in the 1920, late 1920s, the NACA um, more actively got involved in aircraft design. They did the parameter variation studies, 
uh, leading to the NECA airfoil series, all the dry cleanup work uh, best reflected in the streamline. Uh, engine cowling led ultimately to the airframe revolution embodied in the DC-3 in the early 1930s. Uh, metal construction, stress skin, retractable landing gear, variable pitch propellers. That's the point when air transport started to take off. World War II was all about building new laboratories, EMC Cleveland, and solving problems with aircraft needed for the war. One example of the NACA style of research uh, continuing during this time period was in de-icing, for which it won a Collier Trophy. Lou Roder at Ames studied the conditions designed a suite of thermal de-icing technologies and validated them so that they could be applied to any type of aircraft. In the post-war period, the NACA returned to the culture it had developed in the 1930s, first to figure out the new technologies that had been created during the war, like jet engines, and more importantly, how to integrate jet engines into airframes. Missiles were going supersonic, and the aerodynamic analysis the NECA did for them was applied to new supersonic aircraft. Low-speed aerodynamics remained important, and the NACA did much of the aerodynamic constructional analysis that allowed helicopter drones to proliferate. So why did the NACA die in 1958? The NACA did a lot of work anticipating the leap into space, but the aftermath of Sputnik left it vulnerable to a political attack. Specifically, the military had created an ecosystem of firms that provided research on contract. Also, there was the illusion of program management. The NACA had extensive experience in program management. Uh, the many wind tunnels that they had built uh, were incredibly sophisticated, with huge metal hulls matched to very um, precise instrumentation. But the NACA helped people build things that flew. It didn't build them itself. Furthermore, program management and systems engineering were invented by the military ballistic missile <coughs> programs uh, in the mid-1950s, specifically to assert politically that they could manage technological complexity. So when the federal government needed to build civilian rockets, it uh, subsumed the NACA into a new organization. The four labs, Ames, Langley, Lewis, and Dryden, continued to validate space technology while continuing the sort of fundamental research the aerospace industry had grown dependent upon, uh, reflected in uh, rotorcraft and supersonic uh, transports as well as other things. The NEC Advisory Council calls itself a vestige of the NECA main committee. Otherwise, to answer the question, does the NECA live in us, depends on what you look for. And that's primarily in the NECA culture. So the NECA culture can be broken into um, three broad categories. Industrial intelligence, epistemic community, and fundamental engineering. Epistemic community means that the NECA focuses less on generating new knowledge and more on validating the knowledge of the already had. It was a show-me mentality. They were manufacturing certainty. It wasn't about what you know, but about how you know it. And they were building a community of trust. Of course, bringing technological debate to a close required its own ingenuity. Reliable knowledge others could use. Uh, perhaps allowed other people to make money on that uh, technology. Fundamental engineering means that they solve problems using whatever means they had. Mathematical, laboratory experiment, flight test. Often mechanics solved a problem in bending metal in a wind tunnel, and then math skills expressed what had happened later. When rivets got in the way of a useful boundary layer, they engineered better rivets. But industrial intelligence, I think, was key. First, the NACA was a committee made up of nested committees. An executive committee met weekly and made decisions um, on expenditures of money. A main committee met twice yearly, set policy, technical committees, surfing broad areas of technology and subcommittees tackled specific problems. What they did very well was gather intelligence on the state of the art and um, where they found broad problem areas, they focused their attention. The overarching goal of the NACA at the time was to define the problems that the industry was confronting. They also had other means of gathering intelligence. They built offices in New York and Santa Monica and Paris with staff that did nothing but visit aircraft manufacturers and ask them what the problems were and how the NACA labs might help. Remember, this was a time when there were hundreds of firms building aircraft, some of them moving into aircraft from on directions, like spin-offs of bicycle, uh, of bicycle shops. The NACA also held annual inspections, visits of hundreds of people from the military services and industry, where they came, saw the facilities, learned what the NACA could do for them, as long as the military sponsors of the NACA agreed. The NACA also commuted through their technical report system. The most important papers went through several iterations as the questions were uh, refined. The work was double-checked ferociously at the different laboratories. The reports were available to anyone. 
The idea was that the NACA did not solve problems uh, just for one manufacturer. Uh, the ideas they advanced could be useful to all aircraft manufacturers. People will say that the NACA was a midwife for the aircraft industry. In fact, it supported the government customers and regulators of the industry. The NACA supported the public interest first and directly. The NACA supported the industry. The NACA supported the industry was profound, but it was always indirect. So I think an interesting uh, compare and contrast with the NACA was the Guggenheim Foundation, um, an effort by a rich philanthropist, uh, Harry Guggenheim, to take some of his father's mining dollars and advance the state of the art in civil uh, transport. Harry Guggenheim wanted to fly by aircraft. Um, he started this fund in 1926, uh, disbanded it in 1930 when he was appointed ambassador to Cuba. It never had a lot of money, $3 million at the time, which basically equates to about $30 million today. But he used it to do things that the NACA couldn't do, like invest in um, uh, undergraduate education programs. He gave seven grants to uh, university departments that remain some of the leaders uh, in the field. Um, he uh, sponsored uh, safety, uh, safe airplane uh, competitions where 27 different manufacturers uh, tried to make aircraft that would be very stable at low air speeds. Um, and solve some of the problems uh, in shifting from air mail uh, to transport. Um, uh, he hired um, Charles Lindbergh to tour the country and improve the public image of uh, pilots and of aviation. And he funded Robert Goddard's early work in um, liquid multi-stage rockets, uh, which at that point was too dreamy-eyed for the government to um, begin to fund. These were all the sort of things that a philanthropist uh, could do, but he also pushed the government into new areas. Uh, the model airway that he developed um, also had a model weather service, which the US Weather Bureau then uh, took over. Um, the work that he did in aviation medicine uh, underlay what the FAA later did in licensing of pilots. Um, he built his own laboratory, uh, much like the NACA laboratories. It's focused specifically on designing instrumentation for buying and flying. So in almost any uh, case, when the NACA was transforming from a policy role into a fundamental engineering role in the late 1920s, I uh, looked at Guggenheim, uh, the philanthropist, with, um, uh, as sort of a compare and contrast in how they could build their own program. And I want to just end with some thoughts on Harvey Allen. Um, I think uh, most of you will know that Harvey Allen was uh, the uh, aerodynamic genius that came up with the blunt body concept. Um, uh, the blunt body concept uh, was best uh, was first demonstrated in 1957 uh, when the Army Ballistic Missile Agency uh, shot a Jupiter C uh, up into space and the nose cone returned um, safely. Uh, it had a rounded nose, the blonde body shape that Harvey Allen and his crew um, at Ames had been working on. Um, Allen's story actually goes back to 1947 when he began seeing uh, hypersonic effects in the wind tunnel. Um, by 1951, the big problem, of course, was returning <coughs> ballistic missiles uh, uh, to Earth. The services had been trying with their specific programs and failing and coming up with viable design. Uh, Allen's uh, toolkit included um, uh, analysis of boundary layers. It also included a very uh, staunch public service mentality. What he sought to do was aggressive generalization. Um, in a eureka moment, he realized that the blunt shape would force heating into the airstream where it could pass over the entry vehicle. And he expressed this idea in calculus, just enough to show that it could apply to any different type of entry vehicle. Um, but he spent most of his time building facilities that validated that particular technology. Uh, ballistic ranges, which showed uh, could be aerodynamically stable. Um, art jets to look at heat transfer. Um, free flight models uh, that were done on the X-17, uh, looking at uh, flight test data for his one body concept. Um, today, it continues to invent new reentry uh, technologies like the PICA heat shield material, uh, using many of the facilities that um, Alan built or started to build in the late 1950s. Alan's work, I think, embodies what the NACA was all about. Uh, he was not seeing years into the future developing low tier technologies. Uh, he was making specific problems general to everyone. His math helped in entry body design for everyone, and he validated his ideas so that the military would feel confident in putting it in use of the public interest. In his moment of fame in the late 1950s, uh, the press often asked Alan why he didn't join a firm that could pay him more money. And he talked about having the freedom to work out many problems in the NACA. And he talked about that what he did was an essential government function. And at the time, almost everybody in the American aerospace industry agreed. Thanks very much.
morning, I did have a few slides, but we... Uh, it's an honor to be here. This is my first time at your conference, but I've wanted to come for some number of years, so it's um, really a pleasure, and I look forward to hearing all of the conversation and discussion through the rest of the day. Uh, my name is Michelle Gates. I'm the program director for the Asteroid Redirect Mission at NASA headquarters, and I'll tell you a little bit of our status and then the discussion about how we're applying lessons from the past and history uh, to what we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, this uh, set of graphics, images that you're looking at, is um, our um, concept of what crude operations might look like in cislunar space, approximately 50,000 miles above the, few, above the surface of the moon, beyond the surface of the moon, uh, 10 years from now. And um, this uh, concept is actually under development by Johnson Space Center uh, and is the crude mission of the asteroid redirect mission. Sorry, this graphic here. My apologies. Uh, so you see a uh, crew uh, working in tandem with uh, robotics uh, on an asteroid, asteroidal mass, uh, that is within the cislunar uh, gravitational system, however, farther than we have ever uh, taken humans uh, ever before. Uh, so the asteroid redirect mission actually consists of substantial activities across three mission directorates at NASA. We're trying to um, leverage significant ongoing work across the agency in addition to uh, bringing in the innovations and products um, external to the agency and in our international partners as well. Uh, the top row um, pertains to the Science Mission Directorate's um, active work in looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. The second uh, row is a, a robotic redirect mission. Uh, which uh, we have selected a mission concept for earlier this year, actually traverses to a large asteroid in the um, near, uh, near to the Earth, so near Earth asteroid, utilizing an advanced solar electric propulsion system, uh, obtains a large cohesive multi-ton mass from that asteroid, performs a um, deflection a demonstration of the large asteroid, and then ferries that multi-ton mass back to a stable orbit around the moon. Uh, and then 10 years from now, in the graphic that you've just seen, our astronauts would travel further than ever before to select, extract, and return samples of the asteroidal mass uh, with them in uh, the Orion capsule. Here's another graphic for your uh, perusal. Uh, so, at the end, in, the, in terms of the end game, 10 years from now, there would be several technologies um, on board this integrated mission which would contribute to our um, plans for taking humans to Mars in a sustainable, uh, uh, affordable uh, approach, uh, which can be articulated. You can see the strategies and discussions um, in some other products and have a chart at the end which provides um, kind of a strategy graphic uh, uh, for this plan forward. Uh, but in particular to this mission, the advanced solar electric propulsion technologies that will comprise a 40 kilowatt system able to ferry a multi-ton uh, mass, which we'll demonstrate using, utilizing this boulder, uh, through interplanetary trajectory uh, low gravitational field systems. Uh, the um, Orion Space Capsule, which is uh, in this graphic attached to the solar electric propulsion based robotic spacecraft. The robotic capture and manipulation system consisting of a contract and restraint system and um, several, um, actually um, six degrees of freedom, two arms to obtain the asteroidal uh, mass and return it to the system and then provide uh, support to the crew during the um, crewed um, sampling mission. Uh, our EVA capabilities, 50,000 miles above the surface of the moon in deep space, our ability to operate uh, the integrated vehicle stack uh, with all of the moments of inertia and thermal constraints, communications constraints involved in performing a mission like this. Uh, and, and I hope that you could see yourself uh, in this um, image we are um, looking for and have um, solicited twice over the last two years for uh, commercial partnerships for the robotic mission as well as the crewed mission 10 years from now. Uh, done the same through international uh, means and 
uh, investigating and examining um, ways in which we could extend uh, this mission to provide both benefits to um, uh, industry as well as uh, future benefits to our journey to Mars uh, in a sustainable way. This is the agency's current, I would say, strategic image that describes um, both the multi-mission directorate um, commitment and uh, plan to for, for sustainable uh, human missions to Mars, as well as the uh, NASA milestones and missions um, uh, that are defined and planned uh, in this um, strategy, including the International Space Station, which Dr. Newman talked about uh, in detail um, in her remarks. So that's kind of all I have. Okay. Thanks. So I don't have slides, uh, so I'm always speaking from the uh, couch if that works. And it, it's a rare pleasure, for those of you who know me and what I've been doing in the industry for a while, you'll understand how rare a pleasure it is for me to get up and talk about one of government's great success stories and, and one of the things that it truly has done superlatively well in history, uh, which is the NACA. Uh, it, it, it is the rare day that I go through my job and don't crack open an NACA report. Um, all, almost all roads lead back to the NACA and anything fundamental that you do in space and air technology. Um, you know, if I want to work on Flutter and I want to figure out how to do calculations, I open an NACA report. If I want to streamline something, I open an NACA report. If I want to go to a wind tunnel, chances are it's an NACA wind tunnel. If it's not, it's an Air Force wind tunnel or another other government facility wind tunnel. Um, we had, when we were going through the landing gear design on the ship that I'm working on now, the FAA standards are really vague on how you handle um, ships that have a big difference between takeoff and landing weight. Some of the some of the standards in the FARs are a little unclear whether we're talking about the takeoff or landing weight. And for an airplane, that that's not such a large difference that it's really all that important. For a vehicle with a high mass ratio, it's very important. I asked the FAA where those numbers came from; they didn't know. Um, I went looking around and finally found the NACA report that I clearly, word for word, all the FARs have been lifted out of. Unfortunately, they explained where the numbers came from. So I was able to figure out which one of those were meant to apply to what by going back to the original research, which was done because the instrument of an airplane and went out and landed it and found out how the landing gear reacted. Uh, I really like the phrase that the historian uh, used of fundamental engineering because it's a role that, that we don't have a way to play right now. You know, there, are, there are still academics doing fundamental research. You know, what does the physics tell you? And there are lots of organizations, public and private, doing applied engineering. How do we solve this particular problem that I have today? But NECA filled a role without which we probably wouldn't be here today, without which we probably wouldn't have won World War II, without which many other things wouldn't have happened, of how do we solve broadly applicable classes of problems that are useful across significant sectors of the aviation industry that are, are in some sense, pre-competitive. You know, it lifts all of the boats of all the people who are going to use that research, not one particular segment of the industry versus another segment of the industry. And it's not, it, it would not have been of the NACA was to build the planes the United States was going to fly and operate, it of course would have focused on the problems that were unique to the planes that were going to build, fly and operate. Instead its purpose was make sure that the industrial base of the United States is the most competitive in the world. And that was a very different mission and a very powerful mission and I don't know where we'd be without it. And I, I'm not exaggerating, it's really a rare day that I don't find myself opening an NAC report. And when I do open a NASA report, chances are it was printed before 1975. Um, because, you know, then Apollo came, and they all stopped doing that kind of work for a while because there was the equivalent of a war on. And then, as they were about to retire, there was a great burst of research of all the ideas they had. They were too busy to work on while we were going to the moon. And then they retired. OK? 
Okay, so what happened in the 1970s? Computers were the big thing, and if you open the NASA report from 1975 on, chances are you see a nice set of dot matrix printed tables in the back that's the run from their latest computer program that they want to tell you about. Well, that computer program is long obsolete. You couldn't get it anyway. It's probably written in Fortran. It doesn't run anymore. Uh, and, and the results are very specific. And although NASA continues to do a lot of very valuable research, more and more and more of the effort is focused more and more narrowly on solving the specific problems that NASA has to do as an agent. NASA views itself as an agent that's going to do certain things in space. And the research that they fund, or the applied engineering that they fund, is about how to solve the problems that they have as actors. And the great progress that's already been talked about, I'm sure you know more about it, about partnering more with commercial industry is great progress. But it's still progress in how can we, NASA, better use the capabilities of you, the industry, to help us, NASA, do what we, NASA, need to do. It's not about how can we, the government agency, use our skills and expertise to improve the competitiveness of the American industry. Uh, the blackest day in, in American aeronautic research was a few years ago when the NASA Technical Report Server went dark. And all the NACA reports, which everybody in the planet has had for so long, were no longer accessible through that service. And in the time that it had been up, all the libraries that I'm familiar with that had all the NAC reports took them out of public access and put them in the archives because why bother? They're all online now. Um, that database is back up, but still at least half the reports I used to have copies of that I go look for are on there. As if, for example, the, I went looking for a lightweight structures report that happened to be on how airships were designed. I don't think airships are highly militarily useful these days, uh, nevertheless, that report is no longer accessible on the NASA the board board server. Um, now, if I spoke Chinese, the Chinese have a complete archive of all the NASA the board boards that's up, but it's not an English language searchable index, so I find it more or less convenient to use. Um, the other thing that, so that rule today is not being filled. There's no agency that, that serves the supply and engineering world that's useful out there. And if you think that's because there's not fundamental work to do, you're just wrong. You know, in five minutes, we can easily think of five years worth of work, of fundamental work that needs to be done that would enable whole sectors of the U.S. emerging aerospace economy to be more advanced, more competitive, more useful. But nobody's funding it, and the companies can't do it because it's too long payoff for them to fund individually. Um, so it's just not being done, at least out of this country. Um, the other thing that was touched on lightly by the historian that I want to focus on a little harder is there's another function that was done by the NACA, which the need to do this in the current industrial base exists, but is not yet screamingly urgent. And that is this brokering of the patent cross-licensing issue. Um, every industry that I know about has had to go through a crisis like that. Um, in the semiconductor industry that I used to work on, we eventually worked out a modus vivendi that we used to call weighing the patents, where you basically stack up, you know, every company cross-licenses their patents to everybody else, you pile your patents on a scale, you figure out which way it tips, and that defines who pays who, how much for the cross-license. Um, you know, in the aircraft industry, we have the Aircraft Manufacturers Association, that was brokered by the NACA. That's a very hard deal to work out between the companies, because it, ver it verges on anti-competitive behavior to get into this discussion about how are we going to let each other use our intellectual property. But it's impossible for one company to have all the good ideas. Um, what's keeping that from being a critical problem right now is that most of the good ideas happened before 1970. Uh, so they're all out there in the public domain and all these startup companies can use all that prior art and that's why we're getting on with life. But now that new work is going on and new inventions are being made, you're starting to see companies making noises about things that most people thought were obvious, but they managed to patent it. So now we're going to figure out some reason why we can keep company B from using that idea. And that's exactly the kind of thing that sort of the aircraft industry in the United States put on hold to talk about the whole one. Um, and that's something we're going to have to do something about. And it's very difficult without a government partner to get over that kind of hurdle, and there's no government partner charter to do that kind of thing. So it's work that desperately needs to be done. I find myself all the time in conferences like this saying the phrase, 
If only we had a national agency that was harder to do fundamental research in space for things that might be useful. Uh, and it's, it's conscious that I do that because I keep finding that problem over and over again. It's not true that NASA's charter to take over from the NACA kept it from doing that. What kept it from doing that was the Apollo program. Um, you know, it was remade again as a national agency to fly things in space, not to assist the aerospace industry in being able to fly things in space. But I want to close with reading the opening purpose of NASA and the NASA Act. I will let you judge for yourself to what extent this characterizes the NASA we have today. This is in law, this is what the purpose of NASA is. The improvement of the usefulness, performance, speed, safety, and efficiency of aeronautical and space vehicles. And I'm skipping over some of the intermediate purposes here, just for my point. And the preservation of the role of the United States as a leader in aeronautical and space science and technology, and in the application thereof to the conduct of peaceful activities within and outside the atmosphere and the making available of agencies directly concerned with national defense, of discoveries that have military value or significance. And I leave it to all of you to decide for yourselves to what extent the agency we have today performs that purpose. Let's see, um, so I'm hoping that uh, I have a good news story. Uh, that, but, uh, but we're in, a, we're in a time of change, and I do, I do want to talk about why I'm here, uh, why I work for NASA, why I'm at Ames, because I think it has a lot to do with the NACA and things that are changing within NASA right now. So I grew up in the 60s. I grew up, and we you know, stopped class, and we watched every launch. We knew how each launch was getting us closer and closer to go into the moon. We all knew we'd get there at some point. And space was just part of our lives. Uh, so it was hard not to be excited about it. Uh, Star Trek, the Jetsons, we're going to live on the moon. I want to be one of those people. So I've been thinking, you know, all in my early 20s, I was getting to say, I, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and then there's a big disappointment, you know, after uh, the space race and things go down. Uh, we're not moving so quickly, and it's, it was hard to tell exactly where we were moving to. So um, when I came to NASA, I got excited. I was in the, the manned space program in the research areas, and I was lucky enough in my career to have worked at enough places to set me up for the best job I ever had, which was um, looking at and working with some of the best people from all the centers. I was at NASA headquarters. And what we were doing, and uh, it started in 99, but I didn't join the group until 2000, was, was looking at how humans could actually go to the moon and how we could go to Mars. Because I don't know how many of you uh, even realize this, but before 2004, we weren't even allowed to talk about it at NASA. If we had anything about technology that would be like for a lunar suit or a lunar habitat, it was taken out of the budget. We were told to focus on the space station. And we weren't even allowed to make pictures about what uh, people on Mars might do. So, but a lot of lucky people, including myself, I got to lead a group that was kind of looking at these things. And what kind of technologies would we need to put in place that would help science, that would help the space station, but was actually laying the foundation to go to the moon and Mars. So uh, actually this group kept changing its name so no one could track us down. And, and we had a lot of fun doing it and we were very successful. But the culmination of that, um, I became the space architect working directly with the administrator and the deputy administrator and we, put together a strategy with other leaders at NASA headquarters and around the agency that became the, ex the uh, vision for space exploration in 2004. It was only after President Bush said that in January of 2004 that we were actually allowed to start talking about going to the moon and Mars and putting it back into our budget. And actually, 
the kinds of things we take for granted now, as far as our long-term architectures, now we can start actually looking at how are we going to do that and, and making progress towards it. So I was very happy we all celebrated for a long time. But then the reality came in. You know, it's very expensive, and is it a priority? And so we've had our eye on Mars. Uh, we've been looking at it for decades. And so we had this moon, Mars, and beyond architecture. But then, because of priorities and realities, it changed to a, a moon focus. And then, as you know, we're now still have our eye on Mars, but it's not a moon focus for our first step. We're going to do an asteroid, which is a, a very good way to, to test out the technologies and to get us set, ready to go to Mars in deep space. But because of this changing uh, way, it, it made me fall back on work that we had done during those days when we were putting together the foundation. And actually, some of the work I was talking to David this morning about some of the work we did at MIT. And one of the things we were looking at, especially in the early 2000s, how do we make a architecture that would last? How do we make it past the elections? How do we make it past new management? How do we make it something that's going to happen, much like we knew we were going to go to the moon during the uh, 70s, the 60s? So the, it came back a really easy answer. I have a, a diagram that shows feedback loops and everything, but the answer was so clear was that you had to have you had to have industry in space, you had to have new markets. People had to be making money in space. Because if you had industry in space, and people were making money with new ways and new business plans, they talked to their congressmen. They helped focus the, the move of civilization out off this planet. And they give something to, uh, to an architecture that NASA and its missions want to accomplish. So, I was really happy to see, you know, we have COTS. That was the first big experiment. That was hard for a lot of people. It's been quite a success where we start depending on industry to provide us with services that they can do that, uh, you know, now we're actually uh, using it for space station and we're seeing so many new business cases coming up. So to me, we're right at this cusp where we're not quite there yet certainly at the very beginning of it, and you here in this room are the ones making it happen. But the reason that I came to Ames and why I do partnerships is more about what was just said. What Jeff said and how Glenn talked about the NACA was that NASA spends a lot of money on creating new technologies that we need for our missions. But that technology is open to you. You know, you don't have to go reinvent the wheel. You, and I, I'm hoping you all know all this, we have these under, what Bruce said in the very beginning, we have this other transactional authority that we turned into agreements called space maps. And that's our primary way of transferring this information. Uh, we have two primary kinds of SpaceX. One is uh, we, we don't exchange any money. That you can come to us because your research is important to the missions that we have and we want to see what you're doing. And, and we have things that you want to see what we're doing. And we help, by working together, we'll do this non-reimbursable space set. We do quite a lot of those at NASA, at every, from every center and from all across the agency. We also do this other thing that you should be very interested in, and I hope you all know about, is that we have expertise at NASA in many areas especially small companies and startups don't have expertise or can't afford the expertise that around everything they might need to do what their business case is putting forward. Well, you can come to NASA and you can, you can tap into that expertise uh, because we would like to transfer that technology to you. Or if we have a facility that you need, like a wind tunnel, because you probably don't want to build your own, and maintain it, but you just need it for the beginning of your designs, you are allowed to reimburse us for the use of our wind tunnels. So when I, after watching what was happening and how the architectures were uh, kept, priorities kept changing, but we're still moving in the right direction, 
maybe not as fast as we'd like. And then this burgeoning new industry started up, and you could you could see it, you know, coming around just from you know, in the last couple of 15 years or so, and it's gaining momentum exponentially. I wanted to be part of that and making sure that we could get these companies in a way that we could provide this kind of data and these facilities, and that and it's not been easy. Anyone that's at NASA will tell you that internally it's not easy. We're still trying to figure out, because we're not in a seal. We are a different activity, and we've been in a different activity since most of us have been at NASA. And we're having to relearn this part of it. Now, we're not stopping our missions, and we're not stopping what our priorities are. Online, we can also help with industry. And we're slowly understanding how to do that. We've had many studies internally. We've been setting up a process internally about how we partner and how how much of NASA's and it has a lot to do with what the industry response is. So I would state that we're at the very beginning of this. And in the future, we'll see a lot of changes. And it's interesting that, I mean, it's important that you take time to make comments and to talk to the agency about what is needed. And I think you'll see a, a, a positive response with that. So, um, geez, where do you go from here? Uh, so many juicy little topics to talk about. Gonna come no, just oh, a little timeline up on our wall um, of the the history on a of the NACA on a timeline. It shows you from 1915 when it was formed and all the different aircraft and things. Like if you go back, um, one of the really cool things that the NAC did at the end of its life was the X-15, and that was a joint program with with the Air Force. But there was a lot of morphing that that was going on in, in this period, and so one of the questions is is do we need to morph again? So let me ask you a question. So if you had to kind of, of typify, you know, the NACA and how it differed from, from uh, the NASA, particularly the Apollo program, one of the ways that we've kind of come in our office to look at that is, is where NACA was basically uh, an industry-led and government-supported activity, where NASA is more of a, especially in Apollo, was a government-led and industry-supported activity, um, now, as we go into the 21st century, um, one, do you agree with that assessment? And two, how does how is NASA going to um, rise to the to the challenge that Jeff laid out there of providing some of this fundamental thing that may be complementary to what it's doing, but may not excuse me keep doing that foundational to to NASA's exploration mission? But would it be useful to help establish this uh, this? commercial space economy that Gary thinks, and, and we think as well, would be very, very beneficial to the broader community. So long question, but Michelle? Yeah. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. Um, I think that the, the purpose of Apollo was important in terms of national security the activities that NAPA started, the aviation industry has clearly been economic engines of this nation. We, I, you know, in thinking about how NACA and NASA have evolved over the decades, there has been a need to, and it's been difficult, to balance the role of the agency and the expenditures within the agency, uh, depending upon whether the nation is at war and there is applied research or vehicle building required or whether the nation has been in a period of needing more fundamental research and balancing those investments has been a challenge since I've been in the agency for over 20 years. I think that the need for the U.S. to lead in the peaceful uses of outer space continues to be an important national security issue as well as a economic opportunity uh, for this nation, increasingly so now that the space station is built, and like David said, we have 
The ISS Research and Development Conference last week had over 600 attendees. I haven't seen a conference like that since the AIAA Aerospace Sciences used to be over at Battleson mm -hmm. at the Valleys in Greenland. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, that is extremely encouraging. And if you look at the data coming out on the experiments being done at LEO and the interest in commercial use of LEO, uh, combined with a, a COX program, a commercial crew, there is a huge opportunity there for this nation. There are, I think, evolving and maturing activities like Gary talked about in how to go beyond LEO, how to ensure peaceful use of outer space while opening up economic benefit. There are a lot of, um, there are several technical and programmatic areas of interest in the entrepreneurial space within the U.S. that we're talking to within the Asteroid Redirect Mission, but also maybe an opportunity for this kind of discussion that you're talking about. Nice long question. Um, Thank you. I think one of our, our big policy challenges in space right now is this false dichotomy between whether government or the private sector is the driver. The correct answer is both. And I say that as a fairly fierce private sector advocate. Um, but you know, th this experiment's been run. The, the experiment between state-run enterprise and private-run enterprise with government support has been run. We know which one works. You know, ask the Soviet Union. It, it, we, we know which one of these models works better. Um, and, and I think there's a fear, a totally unjustified fear, but an understandable fear, that if we stop NASA being the actor, the doer of things in space, that A, will stop doing things in space, and B, NASA won't have anything to do. Um, just a couple of examples. Okay. We think there's water at the poles of the moon. That could be a game changer for everything we do in space. Where is it? What is it? What form is it in? Isn't that an interesting question? If only we had an agency that was chasing those kinds of things. Is there water on Phobos? Gee, if there was, that would completely revolutionize everything that you would do about how you would plan a Mars mission. It would completely invalidate everything we've done for 50 years thinking about how we would get to Mars. Interesting question. Maybe somebody should be looking at that. You know, people in laboratories have talked about doing magnetic shields for coming down from Earth orbit without the need for thermal protection. Gee, that could be a really interesting technology. Um, some experiments might need to be run. Gee, is a company going to do that? Probably not. It's going to take five or ten years to figure out. By that point, the patents are going to run out. It's a darn shame we don't have an agency doing that kind of thing. The, the old, every single person currently at NASA and ten times more over can be gainfully employed for the rest of their career answering these kinds of questions. And if we started answering these kinds of questions, the next time we do a flyby, it's going to be of an extrasolar planet. The, the, we have plenty to do, but the, my colleague on the end is dead right. The continuity of purpose that maintains the forward activity through administrations, through wars, through changes in policy, that comes from the private sector. We don't need a national car program to make sure we have cars next year. We don't need a national computer program to make sure we have computers next year. I'm pretty sure that if the government stops supporting cell phones, we'll still have cell phones next year. There are markets for those things. Bringing those technologies to the point where it is possible for people to make a market out of them is a perfectly appropriate, rational, productive, beneficial activity of government. NACA did it spectacularly well. I think NASA has within it the competencies to perform that role spectacularly well, but we have to charter them with doing it. And in a world of finite budgets, you have to make choices. If we use those resources to support the development of an aerospace industry, we will not use them to perform government-led missions in space. We gotta pick them to be your primary point of emphasis. Well, actually, Jeff made most of my big points, but, uh, but it really is true. I think that, you know, we, when we're coming out of the age where, where the government was doing everything in space and that we had to look 
when industry interacted with us, it was to our requirements and to the way we do it. Uh, and we're going to look over your shoulder and we're going to make sure it's exactly the way we want it. So now we're depend we're going to let industry advertise its abilities to launch things in the space, to actually take crew there sometime to build space stations. And we are going to buy from that where we can go out and do the things, retire the risk on the things that are out there decade ahead of time or, or information. That is something, that is a wonderful role for government. And I, I actually see us moving, I mean, the agency in the last 15 years has moved tremendously in that direction. I would say that you would find most people that you talk to now on board with that. I was talking, uh, Phil McAllister has some wonderful sets of charts. He was looked overseeing the COTS program about how we did things in the past and how we do things and, and what the strengths of that are. And we've already seen that. Because when industry gets involved, we see our own costs go down at NASA, and we can spend that, those funds doing the next things, retiring the risk on the next uh, step, going to the moon, finding out about the water. We have done that. And uh, so we can already, I think we have to be partners all the way along, and, and I'm really uh, upbeat about us moving in that direction, and that we are moving in that direction. At the risk of starting an argument, well, maybe that's good on the panel. Um, everything you said is true, and I agree with it. But I want to go. I want to point out that there's one bridge yet ahead to cross, and that bridge yet ahead to cross is is perhaps subconsciously, you still talk about it, and everybody else does too, as in how these partnerships can help NASA do its thing. Okay, the 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 the, the true change that the NACA mindset had is NACA's reason for being was not to do things. NASA's, re NASA's reason for being was to enable US aerospace, US aircraft and aerospace industry and the US defense establishment to do things that they both found useful to do. And, and NACA didn't, you know, was, NACA had no missions to perform. Its mission was to help other people do their things better. I'll just make one statement on that. I, so, you're, Maybe, I'm not sure not how I want to answer that. But <laughs> so NASA, you know, we've all been brought up, I've been with NASA over 25 years, and, and we were a mission agency. We, we think mission. We, there are missions that I don't think industry is going to do for us, especially in the science areas. And there's... You know, but there's parts of NASA that are exactly the way you describe, right? Our whole aeronautics program is with industry all the way. And so I, you know, so you've got the whole gamut. And so I, I'll apologize, because I actually totally agree with you uh, that the, the picture that we paint of enabling and doing it together as a partnership, I think is important. I think. When, NASA, when I say we're doing missions, it's maybe doing those things that are reducing risk for because that's just the language we use. And that and actually, our guiding app into our long-term architecture is also drive, industry can watch that and influence it. And so that it's more of a partnership all the way along. So I'm not arguing. We get something going. Um, I, I think uh, people in NASA still have a hard time saying, um, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know, which the NSA did, and people believe it. And they would also have a very difficult time saying, effective government committee. But in fact, that was the essence of what the NSA was about. So uh, to Bruce's point, is change possible? It is. Uh, you know, the NSA changed dramatically from the 1930s uh, when it was more military, um, university focused, to the post war period when. Uh, industry involvement became much more competitive. Uh, primarily the, the committee expanded from 12 members to 17, mostly uh, from industry uh, uh, representatives who wanted to make sure that the work the NSA was doing was for them first before it supported the federal agencies. Change was also very evident in looking at the transition in NASA from 
1958 to 1962, and the following. The previous year, um, you know, it was all about the Bon Run, you know, right. measure sustainable um, expedition into space. And Apollo uh, completely destroyed that. And NASA is still sort of living in the past of what Apollo uh, was all about and, and coming through with its uh, huge missions. Um, do I think NASA is ever going to be able to change that focus on large missions uh, and sort of all uh, away from the Apollo model? I'm not quite sure. There are a lot of things they can sort of do around the edges. Um, uh, looking at patents um, and specifically uh, having a more active internal uh, report publication structure, I think is small things that would have a huge impact on the way that um, NASA is seen as an open source contributor to uh, the developing space economy. You know, also I think uh, there needs to be something more like the cable surveys that work so effectively in the science community uh, to be able to work in NASA. Look at things like the virtual institutes, um, survey and uh, the astrology institute, and what a great job they're doing in sort of surveying the state of the art and exploration of science uh, and what questions need to be addressed, what they can say with any certainty about water on other bodies and, and what use that could be. Um, um, uh, for developing their own mission plans. Uh, you know, small or more constrained, but definitely things that would in the long run help NASA with these own missions. Yeah. Sure. I want to tell a short story from another industry because I think it's relevant to this experience. And I had a little bit of personal awareness of, which was Semitech. You know, the, semi the U.S. semiconductor industry was losing badly to the Japanese. We all remember those days, or maybe some of you don't. If you look younger than that, um, you know, and and you know, the government came in and said, "We're here to help you." And they they hired a staff, and they came in, and their their thinking was, "Surely we, the government, can produce a better semiconductor process that we can then hand to you, the American industry, and you'll all be able to compete better with the Japanese." And it was a complete failure. The, 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 every, any one of the companies knew more about how to make a competitive semiconductor process, number one. Number two, no way are the companies going to give their crown jewels away to get to the government to make a better semiconductor process. That's what we used to, 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 to keep competing. Um, nevertheless, Semitech turned out to be very effective because it abandoned that line of thinking and instead went out to industry and said, what is it that you need? in order to be more competitive? And the answer was, well, the reason, one of the reasons we're losing to the Japanese is that the Japanese also have the semiconductor equipment manufacturer. So they get the first access to all of the latest and greatest tools and toys. And we, have, we don't get to start playing with them until after the Japanese already have processes for working on that. So this is a theme you'll hear again. Semitech started developing common standards and common needs and said, you know, if IBM and Intel and AMD and all the other companies can agree on what kind of lithography machines they need, they'll be a critical mass of purchasers and they can go get the latest and greatest stuff because they will then have the same purchasing power collectively that the Japanese have because they're effectively government backed. Uh, and it worked magnificently. But again, that, that magnificent success was achieved because of the change of orientation from is the government the doer or is the government there to facilitate the doing that is taking place in the private sector? Um, and I've never forgotten that model. I think there are lessons learned for how we can make this work effectively in the future. And I think to, to follow that, I thought the interesting thing about Semitech too was that at, at some point, the industry invited the government to exit. Yes. Yeah, and, and the government did, and went off to do other things. Shen, I mean, I'm sorry, Michelle. So I think one distinction there is that in Semitech's case, the market was right there. And in some of the areas where we're trying to deal with in NASA, the market is either a near future market or a very strategic potential market. At least the areas that I'm dealing in are the strategic potential market type futures. And those are less difficult to immediately quantify value so, so, so let me follow that up with a, with a shorter question. Um, NASA has been using an intriguing new word um, in the last year or two, and that's pioneering. 
And so what, what does that imply to you? And, and it, it seems to me that that's very helpful in, in maybe making this transition into this new way of doing things. Because if you ex take the, the mission orientation um, that we've had historically, and now you expand that out to more of a pioneering, which implies infrastructure, which implies reusability, that we're going to go do this more than once, um, you know, is that a step in the right direction? And if so, how do we help that along? <laughs> um, let's see. I didn't say it was easy. I just said it was short. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I actually, you know, I think this whole it is kind of answered by our question, what we just talked about, especially what Michelle talked about, because I've been working with her on ARM, and we're looking at industries that uh, it's hard to show, you know, what your uh, value chain is going to be when your business case is going to come true. But you know in the long term, if civilization's moving off this planet in maybe 50 years, maybe less, and we're going to have permanent bases on the moon, and someday permanent bases on Mars, and this is going, and you believe in that, that destiny, then the markets are, un, you know, unbelievably infinity about how much money can be made, because the people who are living on the moon are going to want a beer and some entertainment when they get home, and they're going to want all the creature comforts, and they're going to want everything they have while they're there at the base, or maybe even they're there for, for longer periods. So, how do, when do you start making money on that? And if you're if you're an industry that looks at mining and 3D printing and creating all the, because you're not going to bring it from Earth, you're going to have to make it in space. You're going to have to learn how to make it there. So there's all these new techniques that are coming online now, synthetic biology to, to get things there uh, that you don't that you want to recreate. So, to me, NASA is is kind of leading the way on this, and it gets back to reducing risk. I think you know because the business cases aren't there. There aren't people living on the moon, and and there's a maybe chicken and the egg thing or whatever. But somebody's got to make those investments. Because the companies need to be come into an infrastructure where their business case is accepted by the people who are going to be the investors, and it's realistic. And that I think NASA plays a big role, especially as we move off this planet. Um, so I'm all in favor of the word pioneer, um, pioneering, especially if it kills the word precursor. Um, you know, precursor as, as a word, as a concept, is something that's fairly recent, I mean, within the past 10, 20 years. Um, if you ask people today what the precursors to Apollo were, they most likely would say uh, Ranger Surveyor Orbiter. You ask people at the time, and they probably would have said, you know, which were the spacecraft to land on the moon, for those of you too young to remember. Um, if you ask people at the time, they would have said uh, Mercury Gemini, um, because they established the, the infrastructure for human exploration. Um, but in fact, in the 1960s, nobody used the word precursor. You, know, you could do a Google search, and the only time it came off uh, was a chemist. Who, in, in chemistry, precursor has a different um, meaning. It's, a, it's a, an element that's transformed into something else. It's not a, a step you take to uh, verify knowledge so that you can then move forward. And you know, as, as an historian, the word precursor is especially dangerous because it implies you know where you're going. Um, you know, it implies that you, you are doing something as a step to something else. Um, sometimes that's true. I mean, sometimes there are types of knowledge and types of technology that need to be tested out before you could make an investment in something longer. But you could also make the argument that, you know, in the time scales we're looking at in space exploration, you know, 20 years or so for the missions that we've been talking about to come to fruition, we don't know that those are ever going to happen. The only way you can say something is a precursor is looking at it retrospectively, not um, and I think NASA needs to start pioneering. That is just sending stuff out, bending metal, shooting things, or asking the industry what they can do uh, with that pioneering technology in a very broad, progressively generalized sense. Uh, I, I love that. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, I'm not a big advocate of the centrally planned model. It, and and you know, there's the... <coughs> The, the, the pretense of knowledge that we that we know exactly what needs to be happening, and we know what the mission of Mars is going to look like, so we know what technologies are needed. So, you know, that, so if we go do those, that's great. And those companies that are working on that, we'll be glad to let them help us. 
Um, and none of it's true. You know, we, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know when we're going to hit when the human beings are going to set foot on Mars. But one thing I do know is it won't look like the Earth in five. Uh, and if, in order for the government assistance and support of industries that it thinks are strategically useful in aerospace, for good reasons for being strategically useful, um, is done more by doing a sort of a gap analysis. You know, what problems do people have? You know, I agree that the business case for these things is very, very far out. And obviously, you can't just leave it to the private sector alone. It won't happen. But uh, you could go to the private sector companies that are looking at putting business plans together on that, to pick one example, and say, what problems do you have? What, what don't you know? And, and that would be a useful guide for things that we might want to do. And, and we might be very surprised. And maybe you've done that already. We actually, a couple years ago, um, in June 2013, released a card by for our mission and did ask or ideas to come in on potential partnerships. Um, but in, in, and then we actually had a broad area announcement where we asked for um, small dollar level uh, potential contracts to flush out some of these ideas and potential partnerships. And we did get some really strong results um, from two entrepreneurial uh, companies that are interested in this long-term future and institute resource utilization And then I'll open it up to the to the um, to the, the, the folks here, to sit the audience. Yeah, you, you folks out there. Um, so if you go back to um, one of uh, Jeff's previous experiences, which was the Augustine Committee, and this whole idea of the, the flexible path, and then the Obama administration tried to, to roll that out and it was not terribly well received. Um, this idea of let's spend a few years developing the technology and, and laying this new foundation, bringing the technology up to date, and then we'll figure out how we, how we want to do that. It was not terribly well received in Congress, um, and so we, we went back. But remember, this was before the COTS program had played out at all, the commercial orbital transportation services, much less commercial crew. So now, you know, we're, we're much further down the right. We have some more experience about how this works. Do you think it's worth, you know, um, Basically, looking at that again, this whole flexible, you know, path kind of kind of concept, um, especially with what the private sector is trying to do. If you go back to one of the questions that was asked of, of Dava, you know, what, what what's NASA going to do if if when they get to Mars, you know, Elon or somebody else um, is already there, and you know, is that going to be a little bit awkward? <laughs> I, I really appreciate the softball question yeah. at the end. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> National activities of every type are funded not because they're good ideas. Um, they may be good ideas, but that's not why they're funded. They're funded because there are stakeholders. Uh, the the existing stakeholder of NASA is NASA, uh, and and the and the employees of NASA, and the supporting contractors of NASA, and the prime contractors that perform NASA missions, and their network of subcontractors. Um, that's essentially the only politically significant stakeholder of NASA today. Uh, I, I wasn't politically active during Apollo, so I can't tell you from my own experience whether the American taxpayer ever was or wasn't viewed as a stakeholder, but they're not now. Um, so if NASA is going to do anything, firstly, that's a very limited pool of stakeholders, and it's not a growing pool of stakeholders. So if you want to know why NASA's budget never seems to go up, that's why. It, it, it's not serving any new stakeholders. The pie is not getting any bigger. 
if you, if we, if you want NASA to do something either different or bigger than it's doing now, that different, bigger thing has to serve other stakeholders. Um, that's part of what I think the importance that was touched on of what the, the partnership model is. You know, if you, if you, it's, it, I've been critical of it only because I don't think it's a bridge far enough, but it's absolutely in the right direction. Uh, the, the, that, is, that is starting to broaden the base. New companies and new congressional districts, new employees, are suddenly interested in new things that NASA is doing, and that, that makes those programs hard to kill politically, because you know, all of a sudden, some congressmen are never knew they had space in this district, had space in this district. Um, Major changes in government agencies usually only happen in response to catastrophic events. Uh, so, no, I can do. Something is going to have to happen uh, that makes the, the maintenance of the current model politically unhappy. Um, landing on Mars and finding that either Elon or the you know, a, a spectacular advance that shows that a different model from what we've been doing is having more interesting results than the model we've been pursuing, eventually might raise that question. The other thing that might raise that question is the pool of government on defense discretionary spending is getting more and more constrained. It's likely to get more and more constrained for the foreseeable future for various demographic reasons. And so at some point, the model we're on is going to break. Um, I think obviously it would be better to, uh, uh, which is going to come whether we like it or not, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen entirely from inside. I think that something's going to happen from outside. Jerry? Well, um, you know, I'm not, I know some of the things I might say sound like I'm different. And I am in some respect, but, um, but not all, not totally. Uh, but for instance, I think when you say that NASA's for NASA's itself, it's, you're talking maybe about a very a sliver of NASA. Because I mean, the science areas were with the academic, and that's huge. And maybe the world academic, and with the um, with aeronautics, it's all about industry, and all about and new industries coming up with UAVs and everything. It's very active, we're about trying to enable new businesses working very closely, and they're not mission oriented. I think it's when you get into deep space missions and humans uh, in particular that you're right, in a way. But I do believe, I think what Michelle said is a very important point. The bit, and I think the Symantec uh, response that Michelle had, the business isn't there. We're not, NASA's not competing with plant business plans that exist. And I, it, there's actually a policy, uh, at least, um, in the transportation area that we will not compete. We can debate things about that. But um, but the, the whole thing is is that we are, to me, that by, by reducing some of the risk and by, by spending the kind of money we are to move that far out, will enable new business plans. And I like the idea that we would do that in partnership with industry. Maybe, and now that I believe we are in a, a period of change, where we would allow more input from industry to help decide together how those long-term investments will be made. So, okay. well, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, just on um, the notion of the flexible path, I'm all in favor of that. Um, I mean, I see how many um, architectures and mission studies, you know, lie on uh, library bookshelves, uh, getting dusty. And, you know, it's the historian's job to figure out which one of those many ambiguous statements actually resulted in, in something that looked like hardware and achieve some sort of success. The flexible path needs to be um, very aggressively protected. Um, and just uh, two analogies there. You, know, you mentioned COTS, and uh, COTS is uh, frequently uh, described as an analogy uh, with what the uh, airmail industry was going through in the late 1920s. Uh, there are enormous subsidies, which of course I'm sure everybody in the space uh, industry today would like to see in developing the technology is that in fact it would be flexible, that 
many different types of uh, uh, routes would require a different sort of aircraft. They were developing technology that could use, be used for all of this. But the subsidy, and because there was not that protection until the law changed in 1934, uh, resulted in massive consolidation in the industry. I mean, there are only two um, major airmail carriers which owned most of the aircraft um, production at the time. It was a bad model, it required an act of Congress, and people going to jail to change that. And then you, you, know, you look at how the um, space shuttle was described in the late 1960s, early 1970s. There again, I mean, that was a space truck. It was a flexible model. It was a tool that could be used to get back on the Von Braun paradigm, but to do all sorts of things uh, in space, get you know, huge military satellites up there, build a space station. And in the end, because the shuttle was not protected as a flexible path to getting into low Earth orbit, and then perhaps that mission largely became all about the shuttle. After a few years, it became all about of the space station, all of which was fine, but the idea of a flexible path, because there were no stakeholders to protect it, sort of vanished. Okay, it, let's open it up to, so if you get you up to the microphone, if you have a question, if you can keep it like me, that would be great. Yeah. Um, if, if we want NASA to act like NACA with respect to human spaceflight, the industry has to have a market. And the only market I can think of is tourism. This is an enormous market. So two, two parts to the question. One, is there anything else for human space flight? And second, what should NASA be doing to act like NACA to support uh, space tourism? There are a virtually unlimited list of things that you can do in space, just like on the ground. And, and labor is useful as a factor of production in many of them. Um, the, the problem is right now the, the cost of on-orbit labor is greater than the economic value that it can produce in almost all circumstances. That will not persist indefinitely. Uh, therefore, if you were asking the question, how, what technologies do we lack that enable a greatly expanded use of human labor as a factor of, of space production, the answer would be it's probably easier to shift the cost side of the equation than it is to make it more valuable. And so we should be looking at any array of technologies that makes the cost of putting human beings on orbit and keeping them there and beyond lower. And I'll just add, I really like that answer. Uh, the, um, when we were first talking about going to the moon, Mars, and beyond, one of the things that kept coming up was that question. Because we were focused on doing science in space. The whole program was focused on doing science. So you had to say that you needed humans to do that because they were better than robots. But you know, the fact is, they probably aren't in many respects. It's a lot more expensive to take a human system there. And if you can, especially now with robotics and autonomy growing at the way it is, they certainly won't be in the future. So it's really not that question. I like where Jeff put it. It's really something else about human experience and about the future of humanity and where we want to be. And we can get in case or should we spread ourselves out or are there people who want to be away from the society and live in another place? Those things are always talked about also. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult question to ask depending on the parameters you ask. Uh, two points. Um, one, uh, I personally really resonate with the Neil deGrasse Tyson um, findings that there are three major drivers historically for sustainable human exploration. The first is um, war, second praise of deity, third promise of economic return, not guaranteed economic return, but promise of economic return. And, and, and so if you look at the um, fra frameworks or basis upon which there could be economic return, um, I would say NASA's very engaged in defining risk, which helps companies to evaluate, as well as reducing risk very similarly. Um, I already forgot my second point, so. 
Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to what NASA is doing to support uh, space tourism, but I would ask you back. I'm sorry? Okay, well, first of all, we could ask you what we could do to support space tourism. I'm not sure that you made any effort uh, as an industry to tell NASA. Um, I, I think where I would look. Okay, <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry. Um, so, so NASA has a very vibrant and a diverse set of research efforts going on there that I think could be helpful in space tourism and NASA's uh, doing one of the things that's always done best, which is inspiring the next generation of explorers. Um, you know, the tweets that are coming back from the space station, uh, you know, with the new high definition technologies, I think are doing a remarkable job in convincing people that really there's something spectacular out there. I'd love to get in one more question here, so before we go, because I would love to get the book. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I was just going to ask a, a general question with a couple sub points. Um, Quickly, please. Okay. Uh, is there an existing, an existing sort of global ACA? Um, it seems that this whole panel's uh, What's ACA? Uh, uh, advisory uh, committee. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, advisory committee for. Yeah. How, how close would it be beneficial to have one? How, you know, how close are we? And um, if if not. And it is beneficial. How would we go about starting one in terms of getting global uh, uh, aerospace industry working together to get humanity to do these cool missions and stuff? I don't think it's close. I believe in competition, so I think that's probably a good thing. And, and NASA does have an advisory committee that that you know reports to the administrator, and you know we cycle people through. So so there are, is a mechanism for that, but it's not as global or as um, uh, well, broadly there, based as, as there was back in, in the NACA days. Well, there is a international group of people putting together a a roadmap for human exploration, and so they've been together for many years. And that's about as close as we get. So the agencies that are interested in human uh, exploration do get together. They've created a joint roadmap, but that's about as far as it goes. I mean, each of them are looking at what their pieces will be. Yeah, that's the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting the hook here. So anyway, let me help me thank my panel. Thank you very much.